Welcome to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. I'm your producer, Nika Larian. 30 to 40% of the food that is produced is either lost or wasted, contributing to a global food crisis with over 800 million going to bed hungry. Listen on as USAID experts speak with researchers and development professionals to explore solutions to this critical issue that demands a kitchen sink approach. When it comes to climate, food security, and food system sustainability, we have no time to waste. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. My name is Nika Larian, food loss and waste advisor and producer of The Kitchen Sink. Today, I will be speaking with Joanne Muche Moronga, Chief Operating Officer at Kintaste, a recent awardee through the USAID Market Systems and Partnership Activity Food Loss and Waste Partnership Facility. Together, we will discuss the impact of climate change on coconut production in Kenya, the work Kintaste is doing to reduce food loss and waste and empower women, and the partnership with USAID. Welcome, Joanne. Please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Joanne Muchai Murunga, and uh, like you mentioned, I work at Kentaste as the COO. Um, I'm a, by trade at sales and marketing professional. Um, actually, fun fact, I am a chef uh, by profession, or that's what I studied initially, and then I kind of transitioned into business and then into um, manufacturing and agri-processing. Um, really excited to be here and uh, talk a little bit about uh, food loss waste and what we're doing about it. Well, thank you, Joanne, for sharing a little bit of your background. I did not know that um, you have training as a chef, so you have definitely an interesting perspective when it comes to food loss and waste. So I'm looking forward to exploring that with you further. Let's let's start with Kintaste. Can you provide some background on Kintaste and how you are working to reduce food loss and waste in your operations? Sure. Um, so Kentes is a manufacturing company and we produce coconut products. Um, we work in the south coast of Kenya, which is in East Africa, and we work across the Kenyan coast with about 5,000 smallholder farmers. Um, we source the coconuts from them. We have five collection centers in those regions, and then we bring the coconuts to our factory where we um, make all these you know, nice, amazing products. And we distribute those products in Kenya across about a thousand retail stores. Um, and then also regionally and internationally, both in retail and in bulk. Um, and Kentis has been um, really doing this scale or level of um, production the last three years, but we really did start the journey in 2014, just building up the value chain and beginning to work with farmers in a value chain that has often been neglected. Um, the coconut value chain in Kenya is very disorganized. It is not structured. It's um, relatively young when you compare it to maybe the tea sector or the coffee sector. Um, and Kentis has really been at the forefront of leading um, the growth in this sector. And we're really, really proud of the work that we're doing. So um, in particular with uh, food loss waste, um, like I've mentioned, the coconut value chain is still very young. Uh, we do have in Kenya, some reports say a, a capacity or a production capacity of 300 million coconuts annually. Um, so if you think about it without Kentaste or without any large processor, if it was anybody else, um, these coconuts would mostly be going to waste. Um, the coconuts that are produced at the moment far surpass any other usage, let's say going to traditional or in, informal markets or even home use. And so developing the um, industry and bringing in large form format uh, producers like ourselves is really reducing the, the loss, uh, food loss uh, waste um, in the coconut sector. So that's one of the ways. And then um, we're you know, coming up with ways of using different parts of the coconut, um, if it's the shells, if it's a kernel, if it's a water, um, just transforming all of that into different products. And then also now looking into um, possibly going into other value chains. Um, we'll see if we'll do that. But um, yes, that, that has been the main um, impact that we've had in terms of uh, uh, food loss and waste in, in our sector. That's really great that Kentaste is being so innovative and thoughtful and using all parts of, of the coconut. Can you talk about... Um, this work that you'll be doing with USAID and how that will expand Kente's work to reduce food loss and waste. 
And could you also speak more broadly to how USAID, other donors, and the government can help private sector actors facilitate change to reduce food loss and waste? Sure. Um, so with USAID, we've really partnered to do um, three main things. And the first of those is to expand our production capacity, especially with regard to two products. The first is coconut chips and the second is coconut water. So these are products that we haven't been producing um, or rather we're very, very young or in the very early stages of these products, but it's products that we believe one, have a food loss um, and waste impact. We do reduce that. For example, the coconut water, we have not been processing that all the years that we've been processing. So on average, we've been you know, pouring out 3,000 liters of coconut water a day. And this is revenue you know, going out um, into the drains. But more than that, it has environmental impact. And of course, it is food loss um, waste. So we're going to convert that coconut water into a yummy beverage. We're going to get it onto shelves um, in Kenya, in the US, in other markets. And um, that's going to have a huge impact, not only to us, but our bottom line revenues um, and also to our farmers as a result of that. Um, with the coconut chips, again, another product we're really excited about, um, an innovative product for us. We haven't done this before entering into a snack line or a snack, um, a snack product. Most of our other products are commoditized, you know, the coconut oil or desiccated coconut. So this is where we can be um, kind of young and, and um, energetic with the brand and, and uh, figure that out. But again, in terms of food loss waste, it just means that we can open up a new production line and make a product that we weren't producing before and utilize more coconuts and buy more coconuts from our farmers. Um, with that, then obviously we'll need to expand our markets, which is another um, great USAID um, initiative or, or something that we're partnering with USAID for. And um, with particular to um, expanding our presence in the US market, um, you know, the US for a product like this is by far um, a bigger market than Kenya or um, other markets regionally. So if we just get into the market, get a food foothold with one and two, three retail stores, that would have a huge impact on us. And again, um, this all translates just down to us being able to buy and process more coconuts um, and also, you know, impact the farmers a lot more. And the last one is um, in terms of um, job creation and employment. Um, all of this will ultimately lead to us needing to employ more people, uh, more youth, more women, um, and yeah, hopefully just make an impact in, in the communities that we work in. Um, when I look at it more broadly, um, that's, that's actually a great question. So at Kentis, we have um, some great impact investors who have come in um, and supported us over the years. Uh, but I think what we've noticed um, in terms of food loss waste is there needs to be patient investment um, in terms of allowing companies to create a little bit slower, um, to invest in um, R&D, to try new products. And that's one of the things that partnering with USAID has allowed us to now do is to use the funds, um, which is a grant, um, to use the funds now to experiment, to get the products right, to get the marketing aspect right, to get um, everything right so that we're able to take it to market. I think often when you look at funding or other partners um, who have maybe interest tacked on, on uh, loans or have very punitive um, time limits on loans on things or investments, um, that makes it a lot harder, especially for SMEs, uh, to get that process right. So I think that's the one thing that I would say um, to other donors, government, private sector is, a lot more patient capital is required in the sectors, especially with SMEs in developing countries as well. Yep. That's a really great point, Joanne. And I'm um, excited to be a part of the MSP Food Loss and Waste Partnership Facility. So I'm, I'm very excited to see what Kintase does with the partnership as one of our first formalized agreements. Um, really excited to see the work that we're going to do together to, um, like, as you said, increase production of this new product, this coconut water. I do have a question. I know you, you we're talking about how Kintaste is really thinking of how to use all parts of the coconut. Can you speak to how you're using the shells and um, perhaps plan to use the husks in the future as well? 
Um, yeah, absolutely. So with the shells at the moment, um, when we de-shell or take off the shell of the coconut, we use that currently to power our um, dryers. So it becomes a source of energy um, to, you know, fire up the dryers. Um, but one of the things that we're looking at in future is transforming that into some sort of um, either charcoal or uh, condensed um, energy. So I guess it's charcoal. Um, we find that it helps a lot more with the burning efficiency. Um, the energy is much, much better if you're using that instead of, let's say, firewood or other um, forms of energy. So that's one thing that we're looking at. Um, and with the coconut husks as well. So uh, traditionally in Kenya and in the region where we are, um, a lot of the households around us come and collect the husks and use that as energy in their homes, you know, to light up their cook stoves um, when they're, you know, cooking and doing other things within the household. So we want to, again, try and make that a little bit more efficient, uh, transforming the husks into a more efficient source of energy, whether it's us or partnering with somebody else who can do that. Um, and then another project we're also looking at is biochar. Um, there's, uh, you know, a craze, a recent, I don't know how recent it is, but there's definitely a, a buzzword that is biochar now um, and how it helps to retain moisture and nutrients for plants. And we've actually run a couple of trials. Um, I think the disadvantage is when we run the trials, it was during the worst drought that Kenya has seen in the last 40 years. So there was a lot of distorted um, results coming out of that. But we want to kind of run the trials again, see um, what what distributing biochars to our farmers can do for the coconut tree production. Um, if we're able to move production from, you know, 20 to 30 coconuts per um, tree on average to 80 to 100 coconuts on, uh, per tree on average. Um, again, huge impact to um, farmers, their impact, um, huge impact for us as well, because we can get coconuts much easier than we're getting them now. And all around, it's um, going to be good impact if we can get that project off the ground. Yeah, definitely a lot of buzzwords um, that are growing in popularity and interest, biochar, circular economy approaches, zero waste companies. So it seems like Kintase is really on, on the cutting edge when it comes to thinking about sustainability and reducing food loss and waste. As a part of this partnership with USAID and increasing production of these new products and, and scaling, you mentioned uh, increasing employment. So can you speak to any training or extension services you can taste is providing? And can you speak to how you're working with farmers? Yeah, absolutely. So um, another great um, part of the partnership that we have with USAID, um, actually there's a couple of elements here. And the first is um, increasing our farmer um, base. So like I mentioned, we're working with just about 5,000 farmers now, um, and we're targeting to have 6,000 farmers by the end of next year. So registering a lot more farmers into a database, which means that we have to increase our field team. Um, at the moment, we have a, a field team of about 30 people. Um, they're constantly in the field registering farmers, working with them, training them, um, doing inspections and audits on our organic and fair for life certifications. Um, and then, of course, purchasing coconuts from them. And once we move, you know, as we increase the farmers, we'll definitely have to increase the team size just to make sure that we um, efficiently serve all of our farmers. So that's definitely one of the things that we're going to do. Um, we, we're also going to, as part of the program, incorporate a lot of climate resilience uh, training. So like I mentioned, the last uh, two years have been really, really tough in Kenya in terms of the environment. Um, we again, we went through the worst drought in the last 40 years, and it was a pretty prolonged period as well. Um, and we're just coming out of that. We are thankful that we received um, adequate amounts of rains that will kind of help the coconut trees revive. But um, it was a lesson to a lot of us in different sectors, but especially in the coconut sector, because coconut trees are supposed to be quite drought resilient. Um, but they did um, take quite a hit uh, during the last two years. So we're going to incorporate a lot of training to make sure that, you know, once the drought comes uh, around in the next three, four, five years, because it is a cycle, um, that our farmers are more prepared, they're um, mulching, they're composting, they're preparing the trees, um, and when it comes around it, the trees are stronger. So that's one element that we're going to, to put in. Um, I think another cool element is that we are, as part of, um, training and, and 
um, increasing the team's ability. Uh, the team that was is coming in to do the coconut water or the coconut chips, um, that's going to be an entirely new team. And again, as part of uh, USAID's mission to empower women, we're going to make at least 50% of those new jobs uh, for women, which is really, really cool. Um, and of course, we're going to train all of the people who come in. So it's going to be a lot of training, a lot of training around the technology, um, which is again, very cool. It's, it's the pioneer in the region. Um, the first time anyone is doing this kind of thing with coconuts. So um, we're really excited to do that as well. So I'm really glad that you brought up the work that you're going to be doing to empower women. That's definitely an objective priority at USAID. Can you speak to some of the work that you'll be doing in that space, whether that's providing training or increasing employment for women? Yeah, sure, I can speak about that. Um, so we're actually doing this in two different ways. Um, so on the pharma side, we are empowering more of our women to um, register themselves as farmers. So traditionally, coconuts are a male crop, uh, which means that most of the activities around coconuts um, on the farm are done by men. Um, this is because although coconuts require very little care, um, the harvesting is very labor intensive. The moving of the coconuts around the farm or aggregating the coconuts is also quite labor intensive. So the men tend to do it. And as a result, they tend to register themselves as the farm, as the farm owner. Um, and what we want to do is we want to empower the women who are the actual landowners in, in many cases um, to register themselves um, because ultimately they're the ones who should decide what happens with the money um, from the farms that they own. Uh, so this includes training around you know, gender inclusion, um, around decision making as a family, um, around different aspects of what they can contribute um, and that just to destigmatize de um, them registering themselves as a farm owner. So that's one of the things that we're looking to do. And um, the goal is to have 35% women registered farmers by the end of next year. So um, hopefully that will be just a lot more encourage en encouraging to the women in this region. And then um, the second thing is around our employees. Um, again, like I mentioned, we're planning to have at least 15 new employees in the new production lines and 50% of these being women. Um, uh, in Kenya, women in manufacturing is, as you can imagine, probably more rare than in Western settings. Um, but because we want to have a focus on empowering women in these communities, we are going to give them the, the training that they need. Um, the lines that we're bringing in are highly automated. So that also allows them to engage more with the machinery and get into the production line. Um, we currently have 30% women on staff, but a lot of them are on the administration side, just because again, it's a very labor intensive process uh, um, in, in terms of our processing. But these two lines will, will be very automated and, and will allow them to participate more in production, which um, I think is pretty cool for, for women to get into such uh, departments. So um, really looking forward to that. And yeah, um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to see a lot more women participating in the coconut value chain. That's excellent. I think that's one of the most exciting things about working in the food loss and waste space, but also more particularly with the MSP Food Loss and Waste Partnership Facility is there's so much opportunity for innovation and job creation, empowering women and youth. And at USAID, we also talk about the triple wins of reducing food loss and waste. So the impacts that it can have to improve nutrition and food security, increase economic development, and of course, mitigate climate change. So that is where I want to end our conversation today. I know you spoke earlier about the, the trainings that you're providing on climate resilience, and you mentioned that you've had one of the worst droughts in Kenya. So can you speak a little further to how climate change has impacted the coconut value chain? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so maybe I can just go through a little bit of history with um, Kenti. So um, between 2014 to 2019, 2020, um, it was, I would, don't want to say a passive, but it was a very small business. Um, we were producing for the local market. Um, we were making two or three products, didn't require too much production capacity. Um, with the recent investment from um, investors, we decided to increase our production capacity. So we moved, um, you know, we tripled our capacity between the years of 2019 to 2021. Um, with a triple cap uh, capacity, that means that we needed a, a lot more coconuts. So we went from sourcing, you know, uh, 
4 million coconuts um, in 2020 to sourcing uh, 10 million coconuts in 2021. And um, we were on a good growth trajectory. Um, we had the customers, we had quality, we had the production. Um, and what we were looking for is more growth now in the business. And we began to plan and forecast for that. Um, but end of 2021 came the drought and um, the coconut numbers really, really begun to reduce. And we saw, you know, it just depends on the region where you're in, but we saw impact as bad as, you know, 60% um, reduction in production capacity of coconut trees uh, in some regions. And in some regions, it was 5%. So when you average it out, we estimate that our farmers lost about 30% production capacity um, of their coconuts. And then we also saw... Um, uh, the death of coconut trees. So not only were the coconut trees producing less, um, we actually lost a significant number of coconut trees as well. So um, coming out of that, you know, 2022, 2023, we've had a difficult time uh, sourcing. We've gone back to the 4 million mark, um, whereas we should be growing towards the 30 million mark where we want to be. Um, but it's not an unsurmountable task, right? The coconuts are coming back. The rain, um, again, we're just thankful for the rain. Um, the coconut trees are growing, but the biggest impact, I think, has just been the farmers realizing the contribution coconuts has to their income. Because once we had this period where um, our farmers don't have coconuts, and that is their main source of income, um, it did really affect our farmers. So they're coming back and they're really, really asking for, you know, seedlings. Um, so that's one of the projects that we're looking to uh, run where establishing our own seedling nursery so that we can hand out seedlings. Um, we've done this previously. Um, uh, again, pre-2021, we handed out uh, about 100,000 seedlings um, to our farmers, and we do this on a cost share basis. They pay for 50% of the seedling, and we take 50%. Um, and we want to get back to doing that, but we want to now formalize it and grow it a lot more. So we're looking to hand out um, a million seedlings in the next five years, and it's um, a little bit of an ambitious project for a small company to be doing, you know, without the assistance of government or, or um, you know, other public sector. Um, but with the support of private partners, with um, our investors, with partners like USAID, um, we're really excited to get that going and get seedlings to our farmers, help them establish them, grow them, um, and help them get a lot of the econ um, economic um, uh, capacity or capability that they lost back. So. Yeah, that's one of the things that we're looking to do. Um, I think another thing is still going back into the training um, and extension services, just preparing our farmers a lot more for what um, the, the impacts of drought, especially on, like I said, their um, livelihoods and income, um, just making sure that when it comes around next time that they're prepared, prepared to um, have stronger trees and have coconuts even during those type, tough times. Well, I really applaud the ambitious work that Kintaste is doing in this space. I think um, obviously the the relationship between climate and food systems is, is bi-directional and very intricately linked. And I think a lot of people understand that our food systems and agriculture can have an impact on climate. But I think this case study really demonstrates that climate is having a huge impact on our food systems and agricultural production and also food loss and waste, I think really sits at the center of that of that conversation. So I, I really appreciate that that case study and that that example. I think it really captures not only the, that relationship between climate and food systems, but what some of our private sector actors can do in that space to help address that relationship and um, adapt to climate change and reduce food loss and waste. So really applaud. The work that Cantaste is doing, it seems like you are, are really thinking about this from a lot of different directions. And so I really applaud the work that you're doing and look forward to all that we're able to accomplish together in the USAID Food Loss and Waste Partnership Facility. So thank you so much, Joanne, for taking the time to chat with us today. It was really great to learn more about the work Cantaste is doing. Thank you. Thank you for having me and uh, thank you for being a, a great partner. And we're also looking forward to um, seeing what we accomplish together. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink. This podcast was produced by Nika Larian and is organized by the USAID Food Loss and Waste Community of Practice co-chairs, 
Ahmed Kablan, and Anne Vaughn. Additional thanks goes to Feed the Future, the U.S. government's global food security initiative, and the USAID Center for Nutrition.